Okay, but besides that aside, we have this photodiode down here that captures the light. And besides the fact that this is a leading question, would you believe me if I told you that photodiodes cannot actually capture color information? They are only capable of capturing grayscale information. And so I know I have to make that a rhetorical question because I basically told you that answer before I even gave it. So how do they fix this? If you can only detect black to white and not any colors, how would you try to detect color information with it? And there's a big hint right here. So manufacturers actually use different filters, color filters underneath the micro lens to filter out different colors of light. These tend to be called color filter arrays. And so we usually have three different colors associated with one of these color filter arrays. Um, and these, these filters are you're probably familiar with from our discussions of, of color as it relates to uh, computers and, and technology. So we have a red filter, a green filter, and a blue filter. And the whole point of these is to allow, for example, from the red filter, only the red light to be passed through. Or for the green filter, only the green light to be passed through. Similarly for the blue filter. This way, if we know that this particular pixel can only detect red light, then whatever variation we have in the darkness to the brightness of that red light, even though we can only detect sort of grayscale or a complete lack of color, then we will know how much red exists at that particular pixel. Okay. Now, there's yet another problem that comes up because of this. And as you can see, these are pro it's problem after problem after problem with these digital cameras that engineers have had to fix. And luckily, they've, they've done a relatively good job with it. So you'll see that we have three color filter arrays, a red, a green, and a blue. But remember that the pixels themselves are square. So that means that we have, to, so if we have, let's say, a red pixel right here, right next to it, we might have a green pixel. Above it, we can have a blue pixel. What do we do for these other two? Well, could we put another green, another blue? How do we arrange it so that it makes the most sense? Because these pixels are square, how are we going to be able to arrange it so that we can get the most amount of information possible? And so we have the most common color filter array called the Bayer filter. And this is what most digital cameras actually use on top of their sensor is this arrangement of color filters over the, over the pixels themselves. We have a blue, we have, so you can consider it in, in squares of four here. We have a blue, a green, a green, and a red. Then right next to it, a blue, a green, a green, and then a red. So there's a predominance of green filters. Why? Why would we need more green than red or blue? Why is it more important? Right, that's exactly right. So when, from our earlier lecture, talking about how we view the world in terms of brightness or luminance, the green variation is the most important for us to be able to detect variation in luminance. So as, as you recall, the luminance calculation itself, the green was actually twice as important as the red, or even more important than the blue. So engineers use this to their advantage. They, made the majority of the pixels within the sensor, these green pixels, um, to be able to determine the brightness the, uh, to be the most similar as how we would see that particular entry. Now, keep in mind that there are more than just the Bayer filter array. And in fact, uh, uh, if you've used other cameras, you probably, you might have used um, some of these other ones. So you might have, in addition to the Bayer filter, something like this uh, RGBE filter. So some manufacturers now swear by this, uh, by using an additional color, like an emerald color or a cyan color, uh, which they claim will provide more information to the camera to be able to produce colors more accurately, to be able to produce 
the, the luminance more accurately or a variety of other things. Um, whether or not it actually works is another story. It's, it's up for debate. And I would argue that the Bayer filter, because it is so predominant, it is in just about every camera that's out there today, there's been a lot of research on it, so they've optimized it very, very well. So uh, you'll see a variety of other filters um, that are available. And um, I don't think, as with many things, that uh, you should believe the marketing speak if they are talking about you know, especially Sony cameras. They're, they're the ones that have developed a lot of these emerald-based filters. They really push this and say, okay, we have this extra bit of color information that, uh, that these other ones do, and therefore we have better picture quality. Well, as with everything else, you have to do your research and see if that is actually true. It may not be. And, and um, uh, all of these other color filter arrays that exist um, have been used at some point or another, and, um, but for the most part, people just always go back to, to the Bayer color filter array. Now, as you can tell from this, there's yet another problem that we have to deal with. When we look at an image that has been made by a digital camera, even if you look at it at 100%, completely blown up, you don't see one pixel that's only blue, right next to it is another pixel that's only green, right next to it is another pixel that's only red. No, you see this, they've recombined this color information back into the original color that was in the scene. So the yellows or the, the shades of, of brown or whatever other shades, violet, that existed within the scene are then reconstructed by the camera. And this is something that, um, that is, yet again, technology has been able to help improve over time. And it is this concept of demosaicing. And the whole point of this is to take each of all of the information that's provided to us by the sensor and try to recombine it back f into whatever original colors existed in the photograph itself. Now, we could try to do this um, somewhat blindly, and we could say, OK, well, we have these, um, these blocks of four, so the, the blue, green, green, red, blue, green, green, red. We could just try to recombine each of those blocks and then that is a pixel. So each of these four blocks creates one pixel. Then each of the four blocks next to it creates one pixel, so on and so forth. But that's not very efficient. That decreases the amount of megapixels that we have in this particular sensor by a great degree. Because now we were requiring four pixels to create just one pixel in the end result. And um, as a side note, um, you may notice when you're looking at uh, cameras and, and camera specifications, that they're always talking about two different megapixel ratings. So the camera itself has like a 12 megapixel rating, and then they say, oh, it actually has like 11.5 effective megapixels. And the reason for that is this demosaicing that we're going to discuss right now. So what happens is that we have these four pixels that are next to each other. We can recombine them to get the color information from each. But then we can also use, we can just shift over by one pixel, and you see that we have exactly the same arrangement. It's just sort of flipped. So we still have the blue, the green, the green, and the red, but it's just, it's right next door. So we can still get another piece of color information between those as well. So what a camera tends to do is that if we have a grid of these, of these 16 pixels, it will generate first the color information between these four, then these four, then these four, then these four. So we get four pixels out of that. Then it will go in between these major squares as well. So it'll do this one next. And then, let's see, so then th this one down here, and then this one, and this one, and then finally the one right in the center after it has all of this color information. So out of this, you'll notice that if we actually had this sensor that existed in a digital camera, this is a 16 pixel sensor. Right, because there's four pixels down, four pixels up, so we have 16 pixels total. But the end result is that we only get nine pixels of information out of it. We can't get color information out of just these two edge pieces because it's only a green and a blue. It's, there's no red information or anything like that, so we're out of luck for those. So that is why typically you see in a digital camera effective pixel count that is less than the actual pixel count within the camera itself. So 
this is in, sort of an inconvenient problem for us to have. It's, 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 it's messy, it's, it's difficult to recombine this color information. As you can imagine, it could be error prone. So if we have um, some pattern that actually repeats quickly enough um, that it changes over each pixel, then you can imagine that as it recombines this information, it might get it wrong. And this is a problem that does, um, that does actually exist. And engineers again tried to correct this problem with a different type of sensor altogether. And so we actually have this other type of sensor that exists on the market today called a Foveon sensor. And this, um, this, this sensor sounds great, and you'll, you'll understand why in just a moment. But unfortunately, it's so rarely used, and the technology is just so rarely seen that you really have to compromise in other areas to obtain a camera that has this sort of technology. But what does it do? OK, let's just take a look. So rather than have color filter arrays, where it has a pixel that can only detect one color, and then right next to it, a pixel that can only detect a different type of color, it uses the properties of silicon itself. If you remember, these sensors are, are made in, out of silicon wafers, if you remember from the, uh, the, uh, the How It's Made video from last time. And they analyzed how light is absorbed by silicon. And they found that as light travels through silicon, well, blue gets absorbed first and doesn't travel down very far. Then green gets absorbed next, and it only travels down maybe, you know, sort of midway. And red, the red light, tends to travel the farthest through this layer of silicon. And so they use this to their advantage. They would layer photodiodes, one on top of the other, the blue one being at the very top, and the green one being underneath it, then the red one being underneath that, so that at each pixel, there were three photodiodes that would capture each of the different red, green, or blue color information. And so remember that these still cannot detect color. It's just using this absorption idea uh, to try to figure out what color it is. So if it sees some information down here, then it knows that it's red. And then it'll see more information up here, but it can try to subtract the red out through a variety of means. And, um, we would be able to reconstruct the image. But the advantage to this is that every single pixel in the sensor has all three pieces of color information. So we don't have to do this really messy, really ugly demosaicing algorithm to try to reconstruct the original colors of the image. We are able to obtain all the colors at that pixel just by itself, just by having it right there. Now, typically in a Foveon sensor, um, there are many fewer, fewer megapixels. So I think you know, the most modern Foveon sensor in a digital SLR size is something like six megapixels or, or something like that, which doesn't sound like a lot. But the reason that this is good is that, remember, every pixel has three photodiodes. So it has essentially the same amount of information as an 18 megapixel camera because 18 megapixels, even though we have 18, we have three times as much information, every pixel is only getting a third of the amount of information as the Foveon sensor. So these Foveon sensors, even though they are much, uh, they have many fewer megapixels, this, the pixels themselves are able to be a little bit bigger. The images as well will be a lot sharper and potentially a lot more color accurate as well. But as you might be able to guess, there could be some problems with this. Any ideas what, what sort of problems we have with this particular type of sensor? Any guesses? So one of them might be noise in the color information itself. So keep in mind that this blue up here is getting all of the light information. And so we have to try to subtract out that additional light information that existed over here. So it could be problematic in that sense. We could get some color noise. And in fact, um, this is one of the major problems of Foveon sensors, is this, this color noise that exists, particularly in the blue channel. Uh, and if you were to take a look at some of the, uh, the uh, 
sample images from, from cameras that use these Fovian sensors, and I think the major manufacturer is, is Sigma that uses these, uh, these particular sensors, you might notice that particular noise level. Now, one of the ways that um, this, besides having the advantage over Bayer color filter arrays, and that this doesn't have um, to do the demosaicing, another reason that this is good is that there isn't the filter on top of the, on top of the sensor itself. So we, we, every time, and keep in mind that every time we have something between where we're capturing the light and where the light is coming from itself, we are decreasing that amount of light. So light that's coming through this, this filter, it's probably being decreased by some amount. And so we don't have that filter, we don't have that filter and we don't have that problem in Foveon sensors. So this, this, I mean, it sounds great, but unfortunately it's just not, it has not been researched to the degree that um, these Bayer filter uh, sensors have. And so I think that now, even though Foveon sensors for a long time were doing very, very well, they just have not kept up. They just, they've not put the, the money behind it that's been necessary and the adoption has not been high enough to do it. But to try to convince you that this, this technology is actually something that's worthwhile, we can take a look at these series of images that pits the original Canon 5D, which was sort of the first full frame sensor that was accessible to, um, to the masses because it wasn't over $5,000 of, of a camera, compared to the Sigma SD14, which used a Fovian, um, a Fovian sensor instead. So even though, and this was a pretty popular comparison because um, I believe they, I don't remember if they were the same size sensors themselves, but the, uh, the Fovian sensor actually had a third the number of pixels as the 5D, and so it was, it was very good to compare the two. So because it had a third the number of pixels, it was also much smaller. So the, the actual file that you looked at was much smaller. However, looking at that file, excuse me, at 100%, it looked much sharper. There wasn't these jagged lines that the 5D would have, for example, because of this, this color filter array where it had to guess the movement of the color, or no, that's not right to say, but how the, the color was formed in the original scene. And particular problems for this are diagonal lines, as you can imagine. So we're only comparing pixels right next to each other. So there's two pixels somewhere around here where one of them was getting pink color information, and then the pixel right next to it wasn't. So it had to try to figure out what was going on with that particular piece of color. And so this demosaicing algorithm causes this sort of softness in the image, in the 5D image, that just is not present in the Sigma image. So even if we increase the size of this Fovian image, it still looks sharper. Like these lines, they look very smooth, very straight compared to that of the Bayer color filter array. Yes? Uh, so I think the difference in the background is just because of the placement of the cameras. So I don't remember exactly the test conditions here, but if they had even the cameras sitting right next to each other versus actually you know, making sure they were in the exact same place, that would account for that difference. But even despite that, um, that difference in, in that slight difference in framing, I think that it still is interesting to see how the, the two sensors are able to form um, this, this particularly difficult section of color. And so I, uh, in this case, I don't think it matters that this is green as a background and this is blue. I think we would still see the same, um, the same result if the background colors were, were the same in both. And we can continue to see the same sort of idea, the same sort of problem where looking at the 5D here at 100% of this detail of this leaf, it doesn't look as sharp necessarily as the Sigma one. Now, there are other factors, of course, involved, like the actual lens that was used, unless they use the exact same lens, then there's another factor as well. But just looking at the theory behind how each of these two sensors should work, these images sort of support that idea of what is happening from one sensor to the other. Now, 
I have been misleading you slightly in this comparison, and that is that when I told you about a typical uh, Bayer uh, uh, sensor, or typical sensor that uses a Bayer color filter array, I sort of led you to believe that this was it in terms of the sensor, that there's not much else that's going on here. But there is. So because we have this problem where we have very strict width and height definitions for each color, we have this problem that can occur with, with a sensor where, and just to remind you again, if we have a, um, a pattern that repeats very quickly, so maybe it goes from uh, like a pink to a blue to a pink to a blue, for example, like something like that, a very, very quick motion where uh, it's, it's literally one pixel wide. So in other words, the frequency of this is very, very high then it's going to smudge that color information. It's not going to be able to see that. It might look something like this muddy purple even, be, instead of looking like very well-defined straight lines between the two. So to combat this, engineers put yet another layer on top of these sensors, and it's called an anti-alias layer. So it's, it's what is called a, a low-pass filter, and what it does is it basically softens the image ever so slightly so that these very high frequency changes just do not occur from one pixel to another. So when I show you that this image in the 5D is a little bit softer, it's not necessarily because of the sensor or because of this demosaicing algorithm. It's because in order to combat this problem that the demosaicing algorithm has, we have to put a filter on top of it to soften it slightly, ever so slightly, and you see that right here. You see the slight softness that can occur with these particular cameras um, in this exact sample. Now, to put a more real idea behind this, I can show you yet another example of what might happen. So, let's say we have, we're, we've taken a shot of, I think this is a somebody's foot and it was like where the jeans meet the, the shoe and the jeans as you can imagine have this very very fine texture and it was small enough that every pixel it was changing from a blue to a white to a blue to a white and that is reproduced well in this Fovian sensor because it just so happened that this that the frequency of this particular pattern matched that of the of the pixels it was able to be resolved by the sensor itself now, if we didn't have an anti-alias filter on top of a bare, uh, a bare color filter array sensor, we would get something that looks like this. So yes, it does muddy the, the details a little bit, but you get, do you see this sort of color banding problem where it alternates between this red and this white and this blue? It's because it's of this change, it's happening in every single pixel, and this demosaicing algorithm doesn't know how to handle it, doesn't know what it's looking at, so it's making a guess, and you get this this weird maze-like, um, this weird maze-like problem, and this uh, weird color problem that can exist. So this is a problem, and to combat this, this is where they put that anti-alias filter on top of the sensor. So putting the Bayer fil the the Bayer sensor with a low-pass filter or an, an anti-alias filter. It does smooth out the details so that it, it softens it a little bit, but we remove that really strange maze-like coloring and a lot of the weird effects that can happen with these very high frequency details within this particular shot. So we have removed one, objectional, one objectionable quality of the image and just put in another one. And so arguably, making it softer is a lot better because unless you really, really understand this, um, then you're probably going to look at these images and, and given two cameras that are side by side, one of them where you see this and one of them where it just looks a little bit softer, you'll probably elect the softer one because it's just not as difficult to correct, frankly. It's not as difficult to fix um, uh, later on in software and it's not something that you want to have to, to deal with. Okay, let's just take a quick five minute break and when we come back we'll continue talking about sensors. <laughs>